Kia ora and welcome everybody to this third session of the Poet Week 2023. Um, I'm Christina Hockner and on the Executive Committee of Flans and we also have Otla represented today through Don Gilmore um, who is the president of it and um, Poet Week is jointly organized by Flans and Otla and we also partner with Eden in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you'd like to see any more presentations and want to participate in um, other conversations with other colleagues, feel free to check out all the programs. I'm putting links into the chat and I'm pretty sure some of them will also be recorded so that you can follow up with them. Now, before we get started with the session that Dawn is going to moderate, I'd like us to get centered into the session and started with a karakia. Um, for those not familiar with it, um, that is, that is a way of starting a session in Aotearoa so that we can all focus on what we are doing now for the next hour and a half. And at the end, we'll also have a karakia that will release us back into the rest of our day. Faya te maturanga kia marama, kia fai takina mahi katoa, tumaya tukaha ar ahoha ato ahoha mai tato ia tato katoa. That basically means that we seek knowledge for understanding, have purpose in all that we do, stand tall, be strong, let us show respect for each other. And so it's my pleasure to now hand over to the Australian team um, who will talk to us about joy for the next almost 90 minutes. Over to you, Don. Thank you. And that was beautiful, I might add. Um... So, great. So uh, we have a, a group, and I'm very excited to be here today as the president of Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia. And also I'm the academic director at RMIT Online. So we've got an amazing lineup of speakers. Each speaker will speak for about five to seven minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time to do Q&A. So I'll briefly use, uh, so our topic is lifelong joy, promoting the joy of online learning across context, audience, and time. And I'll briefly use definitions of joy to introduce our panel and what they're gonna present on today. By framing the presentation in this way, we hope that it gets you at home or wherever you might be in the mindset to start making connection to your own practice and where joy might be located within your own practice. So how can we define joy? Uh, if we think about to get, just a sec, there we go. If we think about where we start, usually it's with keywords. And when we go to some of the literature, the keywords that you see related to joy are emotion, mood, disposition and trait and spiritual. So uh, Chin today will talk about the hiring process and how he recruits and places online teachers into classrooms. And in this, he calls out keywords, which have proven to be the best indicators for joy in that part of, of the process. Uh, spoiler alert being reflective practices is, is, is a pretty important piece in that. And then we'll move into thinking about joy as process. So how, how it feels, how an individual perceives situations, and then how an individual is able to evaluate those situations. And this aligns to what Lena will be showcasing today. She's gonna talk about her uh, reflective practice using her own experiences on finding joy with her students in the classroom. She uses candid examples throughout this that make it one of the best um, showcases of ref reflective practices that I've seen. So I'm really excited that she's sharing that with you today. Uh, then there's joy as experience. So that pleasant state experience when people have made progress towards important personal goals, especially when your outcome is even better than you had anticipated or hoped for. Uh, and that that very much speaks to, to self-determination theory, which is one of Tony's favorite topics. So she's going to use the lens of self-determination theory to provide us with insights on how online teachers can enable joy uh, in the relationships and approaches uh, with their online learners. 
Uh, then there's a definition where joy as joy is an outcome. So joy as an outcome. Uh, and that's, you know, having a, a desire, anticipation as a desire and the fulfillment of that. So Sarah is going to use a, a, a theatrical analogy, which is one of my favorite things to do, um, which um, is she'll discuss how teachers acting as performers on a stage can transcend the fourth wall, which she refers to as technology. Uh, to collaboratively shape participation related outcomes or objectives. And then after Sarah, we have joy is a response. So a positive, effective response to an object or external good. And I really like the second line construed rightly and about which one is rightly concerned because it's saying we all get to define what joy is for ourselves and we're always right. So then speaking about joy in this way, Anitra is going to use provocations about space, particularly the learning environment, to discuss the role of affect in a student's learning experience and how this manage, manifests itself in the online context. So thinking about the LMS. So with no further ado, those are the four or five, I think that's five, five presentations today that we're going to do. Again, five to seven minutes each, and then we're going to open it up for questions. What I might call out as well, while well, I'm just switching modes, um, if you want to write one keyword in the chat box about what joy means to you, that would be great. And while I'm while you're doing that, I will get ready to introduce Chin. Uh, so Chin's up first. He's the faculty talent manager at Curio, and his passionate interests are in online learning and teaching transformation. Uh, he also has hands-on teaching experience in business and management at the Faculty of Business and e Economics at the University of Melbourne. And we'll be handing it over to Chin now for him to take us through our first definition of joy. Thank you very much, Dawn, and hello, everyone. Um, from Melbourne, Australia, my name is Chin Samakurio, um, talent managers, um, and my job at Curio is to providing the um, the session academic, the teachers, the subject matter experts, you know, for all our clients. So identifying joy in the context of a teacher teacher application process um, involving recognizing the factor and the aspect that bring enthusiasm, fulfillment, and a sense of satisfaction to an individual as they pursue a teaching uh, position, a casual teaching position. So here is my list of uh, 12 joy factor. So, the first one is passion for teaching. So I look for uh, indication that the, applica the application, um, the applicant is generally passionate um, about teaching, about education. Um, they might express excitement about sharing knowledge, uh, industry experts, interacting with colleagues, staff, students in various settings and how is that contributing to their own personal growth. Um, number two, alignment with values. So we consider whether the applicant uh, values align with Curio um, and also the our client institution missions and values. So a strong alignment often indicate that the applicant uh, find, you know, can find joy in contributing to a course that they believe in, you know, contributing to a short courses that enable the um the staff working at at colleges at uh you know companies to upskill themselves for example it is all about ensuring that a new colleague who walks through the um curio door resonating with our own ethos as well which is curiosity creativity continuous learning and growth um so it's about investing time and resources to bring the uh, to bring in the industry individual who who just don't fit a role, but to elevating it and through the joy of online uh, learning. Number three factor is eagerness to engage uh, with students. So we evaluate if the applicant demonstrating a genuine interest in engaging with students beyond just the classroom uh, instruction that might express a desire to mentor, to guide students, to support students in their personal and academic uh, development. Number four factor is innovative teaching uh, method. So um, we look for how a, the applicants actually excited about implementing innovative ways to teach online, planned it uh, in a normal face-to-face -face settings and how they can blend all of that together to enhance the student's uh, learning uh, outcome. Uh, number five is positive impact and growth. So we look for example, 
in the applicant in the applicant materials and interviews and um and teaching demonstration that they discuss how they have put positively impact uh, the student life and contributing to uh, to their growth and finding joy in witnessing the individual progresses and success throughout the career, you know, can be a strong indicator. Number six is student center approach. So we're looking for uh, whether, you know, the applicants uh, emphasizes a student center approach in their teaching uh, method, teachers who find choice in tailoring their method uh, to individual students' uh, needs uh, and situations um, can and foster supportive classroom uh, environment, often prioritizing student success and, and well-being. So number seven we look for is enthusiasm in their lifelong uh, learning. So teachers who express enthusiasm um, in their own continuous learning journey and professional development tend to be more engaged um, and joyful in their in their role. So this attitude also shows a commitment to uh, staying current um, in their field by doing conferences, writing book chapters, uh, to make sure that they are very current in their in their field before they come to a, a teaching role with their students. So number eight is reflective practice. So we an applicant who discuss how they reflect on their teaching methods and how they're improving that, how, what they learn from that, how they adapt um, based on the, you know, the student feedback and the outcome is likely to, to find joys in the process for growth and development. So number nine, which is, the, which is uh, the last four that we have over here for you, number nine is connecting with the, uh, the subject matter that they are teaching. So if the applicant convey a deep connection with and passion for the subject that, uh, that they will be teaching, so it's always, often an indicator for the joy that they find in sharing um, their wealth of expertise you know, with the student. You know, this, you know, they've got about 20, 30 years in the field. Um, that is the next one is positive classroom um, environment. So we asked the applicant about how they create a positive and inclusive classroom environment. Uh, teachers who derive joy from fostering a safe and supportive space for all students often prioritize building relationships and promoting a sense of um, belonging. So number 11 that I have here is demonstrated resilience. So joyful teachers often possess the resilience to handle challenges and setback, or even a bad student feedback, for example, with a positive attitude. Um, so look, we look for example of how the applicant has overcome those um, situations, obstacle, and maintain their enthusiasm uh, for, for teaching. And the last one is the evidence for student success. So we, we seek out actively, for, um, for example, anecdotes or good evaluations data. We're looking for teaching references that highlight the, applicant, the applicant's role in student achievement and success in their previous engagement with other clients that they can you know that, that they vote for. Teachers who find joy in helping students excel tend to leave a positive impact. So um, remembering that identifying joy uh, in the teacher application um, process involves assessing not only the applicant's um, qualification experience, but also their attitude, their values, and their alignment um, to those criteria. Is the very curiosities, their creativity, continuous learning, growth, interview recommendation, for example, letters, sample of their teachings, uh, philosophy, Teaching demonstrations uh, can provide more insight into how you can chat with someone, can find joy in things that they are about to do. Uh, and here is my, uh, some of the references for you over there. Yeah, that's it for me, Don. Excellent, thanks, Chin. Uh, I love that there are 12 factors in Chin's presentation because as Cherry called out in, in the chat, um, it'll be different based on our context. So I think there's something in there for everyone. And what really is that one thing that drives joy in the context that you're working in? So I've I've put a, a follow-up question in the chat for everyone to think about. And you can feel free to respond to that there as we transition to our next speaker. So we're moving in now to that reflective practice space and thinking about joy as a process and how it feels. Uh, Lena is the Associate Director of Learning Experience at RMIT's College of Vocational e Education. 
She is an experienced and innovative organizational and learning development leader with a deep understanding of effective pedagogical strategies and a passion for people. Uh, one of the significant achievements during her tenure at RMIT includes the development of a successful launch of a Bachelor of a Bachelor of Business, people like to call it Be Buzz. <laughs> and uh, in recognition of the work that Lena led her team through, that her, Lena's team won the Vice Chancellor's Leadership Award for Imagination. So we're gonna hand it over to Lena, who's going to take us through the next part of the presentation. Fantastic, thanks so much, Dawn. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. We did a dry run earlier, so fingers crossed this all works well. All right, we good to go? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Dawn. So hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me today and for the opportunity to be here. So like Dawn just said, my name is Lena. I'm the Associate Director for Learning Experience at RMIT University in the College of Vocational Education. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with everyone my experiences of joy in a learning and teaching environment. Um, and in order to do this, I really want to share with you my first experience of my least joyful moment in learning and teaching. So in 2005, I just completed my master's in education and training and had started my real job as a course coordinator and a trainer and assessor in a private training organisation. Now, the programs that I will be teaching into were people looking to work in aged care, nursing, and to become trainers and assessors. And my role was to teach disability and aged care support workers who were looking to upskill into a supervisory role. And there were a total of five students in my first class. And it was a course with lots of occupational health and safety, looking at plans and policies, and also coordinating people with disabilities from point A to point B. So I had spent weeks putting together a PowerPoint presentation, about 100 slides full of text, not an inch of white space on the slide and not a single image in, slide, in sight. But um, proud to say there were lots of fancy text transitions. Um, and I talked at these five students for two hours straight. Whoops, oopsies. Okay, whoops. Okay, so by 11 a.m., two of the five students were asleep. And as the day went on, three of the five students fell asleep. And I taught the entire first course like this, six hours a day, twice a week, for three weeks. None of these five people look like they had any life left in them at the end of those three weeks, um, let alone joy. So what I had learned in those three weeks was my PowerPoints didn't bring the joy I thought it would. The students sleeping was also a bit of a give giveaway. But I think what upset me the most was the learning experience that I had created and was so proud of and had put so much work into didn't bring the students joy. And as a result, I didn't create any joy for myself either. What I also learned was that as a teacher, I never wanted to feel the same way again. So I looked at the program and the course delivery and I brought, there was a cultural diversity unit. So I brought that forward. And for the next two weeks, I planned for us to be out of the classroom and to have excursions. And at the time I did that because I thought I cannot possibly torture these five people and talk at these students anymore. And the excursions will get us out and about from the classroom. And to be quite honest, I knew I didn't know, I didn't have enough um, or know enough about cultural diversity to fill six hours a day, twice a week for the next two weeks. And this is also my way of buying myself some time um, and trying to work out how I was going to teach the rest of this program. And so for the next two weeks on these excursions, we visited mosques, Buddhist temples, Sikh temples, synagogues, churches and Indigenous centres and museums. So 
So what did I observe and learn from this experience of joy to no joy? So, oh, I think I've missed a slide here. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. What, what I observed during these excursions was joy and the joy was physical. So first of all, no one fell asleep. That was always a good start. Um, but the joy was also on the students' faces. The joy was in their curiosity and in the types of questions they asked. The joy was in the way that they were brave enough to try new and unfamiliar foods that was offered to them. Um, the joy was in their collaboration and the vulnerability and in the way that they shared personal stories and experiences with each other. And then amongst all of this joy, I had a moment of panic and I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? How on earth am I going to emulate this joy back into this classroom with my very informative and amazing transition word art PowerPoints? And of course, the answer is I couldn't. But what I did observe and learn from this experience of no joy to joy, there were three key things. The first one was understanding the why and how information is important to students and their job. The second thing was that students found joy in each other and through that informal peer-to-peer -peer learning situation. And the third thing was that curiosity also brought joy. And then I thought, well, what does this actually look like in a course and through learning design? So for me, over the last almost, you know, 20 years, there are a couple of things that I always incorporate into learning design. And the first is that I find that a before, during and after class structure works well to try and introduce joy into the class. So for example, using readings, podcasts, lectures, practice quizzes, and I'm sure some of you may be also doing, you know, amazing PowerPoint slides, but to place all of these resources in the before or the after the class. And that way we are able to use the during the class to connect with our students. And in the during the class, this is the space where we can share our stories, stories, give space for students to share their thoughts, stories, experiences, use their time to practice skills, use the time to discuss what's happening currently in the news, what's happening on social media, what is controversial, or perhaps who is what's a non-conforming idea or a non-conforming person that is relevant to that particular industry or topic. Oops. And the second, um, once you've divided the learning resource into before, during and after, under those learning resources, have some instructions um, uh, or information that's relating to how the above learning content will really assist the students directly with the particular assessments. And if you want to go one step further, you could also include a sentence or two of which parts of the learning content relate specific criteria in a rubric. So this is particularly effective placed in the during section, se section of the course, because as we all know, two things are to be true about students. One is that they don't really read anything that we give them. And two is that they all want to know when the assessments due. So whilst themselves, assessments themselves don't necessarily bring students joy, um, sharing and telling students how during the class you'll be able to help them directly with an assessment does bring students joy that they didn't know existed or didn't know that they actually wanted or needed. And having students come to class um, brings us as teachers and educators joy. Look at that fancy transition, still got it. Um, and so this is really my long-winded way of sharing with everyone the way that I found joy in my very first ever teaching experience was to experience the exact opposite of joy. It was through reflecting and processing on all the things that made me feel uncomfortable and leaning into that non-joy that um, I was able to stay curious during that trial and error of teaching and finding the balance between what brought me joy but no joy for the students and what may have brought the students joy but was not sustainable or practical for me as an educator. So to end, I believe to appreciate joy, we need to really stay curious about what brings us 
no joy first. That's me. Great, thanks, Lena. And I might just uh, I might just emphasize that last point from Lena. So, you know, thinking about maybe it's our take home challenge today for everyone to think about what doesn't bring joy and see how between now and the end of the year, we might transform that because Lena really role modeled that for us in her presentation. So we're moving on next to Tony, who uses the lens of self-determination theory to provide us with insights on how we can enable joy in our learners. Um, Tony has shown up today. Hello, Tony. Would you still like me to use the recording? Excellent. Yes. No worries. Feel free to say hi or anything. Okay. So, uh, do this. <laughs> Sorry, as I still talk. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, I pre-recorded this yesterday because I had a, a last minute appointment I had to attend this morning and wasn't sure I was going to make it, but we'll just go with the recording. Excellent. And I might add, having worked with Tony, it's like she's in the room. So Tony has a strong coaching background and she's been actively engaged in the field of online education for over a decade. Today, Tony's dedicated to mentoring industry experts, helping them to build capability and to excel in online teaching. Uh, with a thorough understanding of best online practice for teaching and learning, she's garnered extensive experience in both crafting and meticulously reviewing online courses to enable their quality and effectiveness. And rooted in self-determination theory and strength-based approach, Tony's work underscore, underscores a steadfast commitment to advancing transformative digital learning experiences. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Tony. Just give me one sec. There we go. Go. Can everybody see maximizing student joy after my crowded desktop, which I unashamedly share? Okay, and here we go. Hello, my name is Tony Jones, and I'm one of the online facilitator coaches at RMIT Online. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about maximizing student joy and how we can use self-determination theory as a framework in order to enhance our students' online experience. So self-determination theory is one that explores the core elements of human motivation and well-being. It helps us to understand what drives the things that we do and how we can achieve positive well-being and fulfillment in our lives. According to SDT, there are three psychological needs that are essential for our well-being, that being autonomy, which means having a sense of choice and control over the actions that we take, relatedness, and this is our need to feel like we, uh, we connect with others and that we feel a sense of belonging, and competence, and that's our need to feel effective and capable to achieve our goals. These needs are really crucial for our overall flourishing and positive mindset. When we satisfy these needs or have others satisfy these needs for us, we experience intrinsic joy. Now, intrinsic joy is the kind of joy that comes from within, not the external pressures or rewards. It's the joy that we feel when we do something that we love and that we find meaningful or that we're very passionate about. As educators, our ultimate goal is to support students to enjoy learning. We want them to find meaning in what they're learning about and then be able to apply it to their lives. Self-determination theory as a framework can help us to guide our teaching practices and strategies to help students to achieve exactly this. By supporting the basic psychological needs of our students, we can help them develop a more intrinsic motivation for learning and enhance their academic performance and well-being. 
in this presentation, I'm going to talk through the three basic psychological needs and give some examples and tips on how you can support these needs for your students. Autonomy and intrinsic motivation drive learners to do things for joy and satisfaction. Autonomous learners are more engaged and persistent in their learning. So how can we cultivate them? Here are some strategies. Let's make it active and fun. Use interactive tools and activities to make learning lively and enjoyable. Consider how you can create an active learning opportunity for your students as opposed to passive learning experiences. In online webinars, this can be achieved by using interactive tools such as polls, quizzes, breakout rooms and chat functions to get students actively engaged. Provide ownership and empowerment. Give students choices and freedom in their learning journey. In this example of an activity, students were shown how to use generative AI to take ownership of their learning and create practice questions to help them develop their skills. This also enabled the learning to be relevant and personal for students. You can help students to personalize their learning experience so that it aligns with their interests and preferences. For example, you can do this by connecting the learning content to real world issues, problems, or scenarios that students care about or invite them to share their own experience, opinions, or perspectives. Fostering connection within the learning environment is also very critical for mitigating isolation in the online environment. If done right, supporting students' need for relatedness will create an environment where students feel valued, engaged, and motivated, which will result in a positive and fulfilling educational experience. To do this, to create a sense of belonging, you can encourage students to share their stories, their experiences, their ideas and opinions, and this will uh, create an environment where the student's voice is valued. Lastly, show that you care. Express genuine care for your students. Display a genuine interest in their well-being and their progression through throughout your course. Acknowledge their challenges and triumphs and instill in them a value, sorry, instill in them a feeling of being valued because this will in turn cultivate joyful learning. And lastly, how can we support the competency of our students? Because this really does play a pivotal role in boosting the, our students' motivation to learn. When they feel competent, it fuels their motivation to progress and embrace challenges. Here's how we can accomplish that. Support moments of achievement. Create um, opportunities for students to practice and master the essential skills that they need to tackle the more difficult challenges and assessments. As their abilities develop and shine, this is when they start to feel accomplishment and achievement and more confident to then try difficult tasks. Help to build their confidence by employing strategies such as timely feedback, um, acknowledging their efforts, recognising when um, a, an experience might be challenging for them, um, and also providing lots of praise for improvement as well as effort. So self-determination theory is a valuable framework for supporting student motivation and maximising joy in learning. It helps us to understand what drives us to do things and how we can achieve the happiness and fulfilment in life. We have learned about the three basic psychological needs that are essential for our well-being, that being autonomy, relatedness and competence. We've also learned how to support these needs in our online teaching practices and strategies and how doing so can enhance the intrinsic motivation and joy of our students. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. My email is there if you have any other questions and attached to the slides is also a reference list if you would like to explore this topic further. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, so uh, we'll make sure to, to mail out the um, slides afterwards. And again, we'll be doing question time at the end. So feel free to pop your questions into the chat and I'll collect them. Uh, while I'm sharing my screen, Anitra is keeping an eye on the chat, just so you know you're not alone. Uh, and moving into our next uh, theme about joy, we'll recall it was related to 
uh, using a theater analogy to talk about how teachers as actors on a stage um, can co-construct -const uh, desires and outcomes with their students. So speaking to us about this today is Dr. Sarah Preston. She's the vice president of ODLA, and she's also the associate professor of digital pedagogies at Griffith University. She was a classroom teacher and deputy education advisor uh, for that enabled en engagement and learning in K through 12. And now she researches K through 12. Uh, in, and uh, in 2020 and 2021, Sarah was awarded the national recognition as the top scholar in the field of teaching and teacher education for K through 12. So she's co-authored over 77 high quality publications with experts from over 20 countries. And I can speak for on behalf of Sarah by saying it's hard to find her in the country, <laughs> which is why we have a recording from her today. Um, and I will pop that up. Sarah is often overseas giving keynotes or working in K through 12 contexts of other countries. And I can also let you know, as someone who has worked with Sarah over the past year quite closely, this also sounds just like her in real life. Hello, my name is Associate Professor Sarah Prestridge and I'm from Griffith University. I wanted to share with you today a new paper that we just had published that really focuses on how teachers develop a sense of presence online. And it's the idea that we're breaking down the fourth wall that I'll explain. So the fourth wall is a theatrical term coined by Thoreau that refers to that invisible wall that separates the actors on the stage and the audience. And it can be argued that the technologies used in online learning have become that fourth wall when we're teaching. Now we know about those cliches of the sage on the stage and the guide on the side. And what can be argued is that when we are trying to teach online, that we use pedagogical practices that mirror more of the sage on the stage because we as teachers become the performers and students become the spectators or the audience. So Erica McWilliams in 2008 came up with this idea instead of sage on the stage and guide on the side, we come, become in these online environments, the middle or in the middle where we're co-designers co-critiques you know um we work with the students as co-participants so how do we actually become the middle or in the middle so we don't move to the sage on the stage and deliver content to students and the students become um the audience and we become the performer so what we did we looked at a lot of different theories as you can see there and we came up with a framework now what that theory suggests all those theories suggest is that to break the fourth wall, we have to engineer student-to-student -student engagement and think about it in that way to co for them to co-construct knowledge um, instead of thinking about engagement as, you know, uh, completing the task or, um, you know, completing the assignment work. So how do we actually, through the process of learning, break the fourth wall by um, developing those, um, or engineering the teacher, engineering those sort of type of student-to-student -student interactions? So based on the community of inquiry, Hillman's and Moore's um, frameworks, we came up with our own framework. And we talked about three different types of presence that really build that social presence online. Um, the first one is individual presence, where the teacher connects the individual to both the class as a group and also uh, the content. The second presence was place presence. And I think this is really interesting because like the classroom, we go to our online synchronous environment. We go to our Blackboard site. We go to our chat channel. Um, you know, we go to places to do our online educational work. And then you have your co-presence where you're trying to look at the interactions between 
the um, instructor and the students and the students to the students. So how does a teacher, what strategies do they use to actually engineer these three different types of presences? And that's what we researched to break the fourth wall. So these are the different types of individual presences. These are the place presences and these are the code presences. And I go into a lot more detail, um, and, and my colleagues, a lot more detail in the actual paper. But what we found at the end is that teachers put a greater emphasis on building the individual presence first, um, where they connect the students to each other and the content. And there's an emergence of this place presence such as the online tool or the environment becomes the place for learning online, much like the classroom does, as I said. And engineering students' engagement with each other around the content is important, but it's not a priority compared initially to that individual engagement. Individual pre at presence may be needed before the co-presence can actually be engineered. And there was a, an emphasis on competencies for engagement, competencies to understand how to use the chat channel, what to do in that space, how to um, uh, work with a student in a breakout room. So it's not just, and also deal with the content. So it's not just providing the content, it's about how to actually support the process of learning with that material. Uh, here's a link to the full paper that is uh, in an open access um, environment and also there is the full um, citation. So it was myself, um, Dr. Catherine, Associate Professor Catherine Main and Dr. Miriam Schmidt who uh, wrote the paper with the research. <laughs> uh, finally, here is some uh, link to some videos. Um, there's about 60 of the videos I think by now that really focus on how to teach online. If you have any questions, please let me know and thank you for listening. So uh, I highly recommend the training resources that Sarah that referred us to there. And then in terms of, of, of that uh, linking it to joy, it's when you get those three areas singing uh, is when students and teachers, particularly in the K through 12 space, but I think we can all agree everywhere in all education contexts, um, particularly if it's what students are seeking, that that's when you really start to get those, those feelings of joy in the learning experience. So moving on to our final presentation today, and then that will be followed by Q&A. Uh, so Anitra is going to talk about learning environments and affect. So Anitra is currently the head of course design at RMIT University's online arm, where she leads the learning design team producing all of RMIT online courses. So that's anything from a short course micro-credential up to a full program of accredited courses. Uh, Anitra's background is in graphic design. She was previously co-chair of online of online director, uh, co-chair and online director of the School of Graphic Design and Digital Media at Academy of Art University in San Francisco, where she taught design, typography, and research methods. So we're going to hand it over to Anitra now, who is our last presenter. And Thanks. I'll go back to the chat box. Thanks, Dawn. I give you the chat box back. Um, let me just share my screen. And luckily, we practiced this. Did it work? Yes, thank you for the thumbs up, Lena. I appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for the intro, Dawn. When Dawn first asked me if I wanted to be a part of this, I said, oh, Dawn, I can't talk about joy, but I can talk about fear. Is that okay? And she said, yes, it was, as long as I got back to the joy at the end. So let's see if I can make that move um, by the end of this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about affect, and I'm glad that I came after Sarah's amazing presentation. I had my thinking face, which looks a little bit annoyed, but that was my thinking face because she said some great things about space there, and I think um, this is a good lead-on to this way of thinking about affect. So I want to start with, if you look up affect in the dictionary, it says to impress the mind or move the feelings of a person. So affect isn't the feelings or emotions inside our body. It can Affect can cause those feelings or emotions inside our body. Affect's kind of a slippery concept, as you can see by that by that definition was to move, like what is it? Um, it's often described um, in different kinds of terms, and I like Greg and Seagworth's um, way of putting it here, um, that it can be described as forces or energies or intensities or shimmers. 
Um, and if we're talking about affect creating emotion inside a person, like it's just as much a powerful thing as a more subtle thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about affect in two ways. Uh, the first way is a, a psychobiological read, reading. So that's affect as an object. It's a very human-centered way of thinking about affect as something that can leap between bodies. So it's something that's contagious and it's capable of being caught. Um, and I reorganized my presentation to go on to this slide first. Um, just had to mix it up at the last minute to keep it fresh. Um, this slide here is uh, uh, at the Matildas game, which is fairly recently. Um, and that is an example of that human-centered affect leaping from body to body. It's also an example of forces or energies because it's quite a powerful thing. Um, you can see it manifest when people get to their feet and do a wave. Um, when they're at a sporting ground, you can feel it at a Taylor Swift concert, concert for instance. There's a feeling that travels around um, igniting the people and jumping from body to body. I'm an actor network theory um, uh, researcher. So I like to think about things, not just about in a human centered way, but also the non-humans and how they contribute um, to these sort of, sorts of learning environments in particular. Um, so that leads to a more post-structuralist notion of affect. So affect is contingent as potential, as not necessarily connected with emotion within human bodies. It's something that's capable of circulating again and being able to be caught but around and through objects, spaces, and ideas, as well as through people. And here's an example of that. This is the National Gallery of London. It is before all the people get there. My friend James took me on a tour around, um, and it really brought home to me that idea that a space has affective potential before any humans are in there. Those beautiful artworks on the walls, the way the light falls into the room, the colours of the walls, everything is generated to create an effective space before I even walked in there. It had that potential. And also it's a good example of shimmers. So uh, galleries are a good example of like shimmers or intensity. So are museums, so are churches. In fact, you could think of churches as machines to generate affect in the people that walk into them. So if we get back then to what does that mean for online learning and what does that mean for physical learning as well? Now, this is a rather blurry pixelated photograph of just an everyday graphic design studio. Now, the graphic design studio pedagogy is, is somewhat unique in that um, it's a benchmarking style of pedagogy. Students literally put their work up on the walls. It gets critiqued. Um, so it gets told, the teacher tells them in front of all of their peers whether it's good or not. Um, and this creates a lot of anxiety. It creates a lot of competition. It also creates an in inspiring environment as well. And the spaces often look like this. They're quite casual. There'll be people sitting around, like working on computers, talking to each other. And you can see a student on the left there, maybe not being too happy about what they're being told at the moment. So there is a lot of fear that circulates in design education. Opening our lens a little bit, we can see there's some posters up on the wall there. And you'll see that practice in design studios a lot. They'll be pinning up exemplar student work or they'll be pinning up work of um, famous designers, just great, inspiring things. And this is to tell students what good is because it's hard to do that in words. But I would also argue that it, it creates both a sort of toxic, heady mixture of fear and inspiration in students as well. And that is very, very intentional. Here's, an, here's what I mean when I say intentional. I know this is intentional because the person who created it told me that it was, okay? So this is the hallway at the Academy of Art University where I used to teach in San Francisco. Now, I taught online from here. I didn't inhabit this space very often and neither did my students. But on-site students would walk around this every day. On the wall there is exemplar student work um, and it's put there to show students what good is, but it's also put there to encourage a sense of um, both inspiration and fear. And Sarah Ahmed talks about affect in objects being sticky and that we will get closer to things that we like and further away from things we don't like. And you can literally see that happening with those couple of shots of those students there. So this is a very effective place. And the thing that my um, too soon to be boss, the chair of the design school, Mary, said to me when she walked me out into the corridor and said, congratulations, we'd love you to come and work for us. Um, but the problem that you have is that your online students don't walk around these hallways every day and they don't feel the fear enough. And like, A, she didn't need to tell me what the fear was because I understood it. And B, I thought, oh, wow, yeah, how am I going to make my online students feel fear? And then immediately on the heels of that is the thought I've been struggling with for a good, like, I don't know, 15 years or not. So now is, should there be fear? Should there instead be joy? See, I'm getting back to the joy. Um, so that's an example of a, both an informal and, an inf and a formal learning space in graphic design studio education where you can see affect traveling around. But what about online? Online spaces are 
clinical, they're scientific, they're always pretty much look the same in, in at least at RMIT online, whether it's a data science course or a service design course, which is more in the design space, more in that sort of studio pedagogy, um, they look the same. They are not um, affective in the same way that those two physical places I showed you were. Um, how does effect travel? Well, it still travels. There are still people in these spaces. There are things like liking things. There are things like polls. There are things like discussion topics where affect can travel. But more than that, when we're trying to like communicate with our students to create that sense of place that um, the previous talk, speaker was talking about, things like emojis actually are very important. Things that help emotion travel through these spaces, but it is translated, it is different. And uh, we have to question what work effect is doing as it travels through these spaces. And I'm going to get back to the joy as I promised. So um, it is a little bit of a provocation as well. This is the School of Philosophy at NYU in New York, um, and it is especially architecturally designed. I think it's beautiful. It's designed to cast rainbows on the walls when, when the sun is shining. It's white, it's contemplative. Think of the sort of space and affect is working on these students to get them into a very contemplative, very life of the mind kind of mood, very different from the hallway that I showed you in the art school, doing different sorts of pedagogical work. Um, and my provocation is we spend a lot of money on these sorts of architectural places. We clearly think it's important as institutions and why don't we do that in the LMS? What could we be doing differently to create both beautiful and fear-filled and joy-filled online spaces. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Back to you, Dawn. Thank you. So I might just recap, um, paraphrasing, why is the LMS so ugly? <laughs> I didn't say ugly, I said clinical, but that's designer speak for ugly, yes. But, but we're being provocative. <laughs> And when you look at those pictures that Anitra showed of the shimmer in the hallways and, and students' work, I think it really does lend itself to, to that sort of hard question that we might want to start asking ourselves. Uh, so just in summary then, in terms of what we've spoken about today, So uh, we talked about lifelong joy. Uh, we've covered uh, K through 12, VE, HE, uh, and many of the people that spoke today also work in uh, learning and development in the micro cred life, lifelong learning space. So promoting the joy of online learning across context, audience, and time. And we looked at joy in key words, joy as a process, joy as an experience, joy as an outcome, and joy as a response. Uh, and each presenter gave us about five to seven minutes of their time. And now we're going to flip it over to the audience and we'll take questions from the audience for anybody that wants to come off the mic, or you can feel free to pop it in the chat box. I'll stop sharing my screen. And Uh, thank you, Anitra. Your 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 presentation was incredibly thought provoking. The audience has said, um, which was her promise that she would be provocative. Yes. Um, did anyone want to ask any questions to any of our any of our speakers today? Uh, if not, I might start then with one that came through via a back channel in the chat box while Chin was speaking. Chin, you mentioned 12 characteristics that you look for in an online teacher. What's What are the top three in your experience that make them most successful? Okay, thank you, Doran. So um, in my experience, the, the top three, one would be uh, for online teaching, that is their passion, their passion that is shown to their work uh, with different, you know, uh, client, different university, different teaching places. Um, and the second one would be on the um, the innovative teaching practices and, and teaching methods, whether, you know, whether it's completely online or whether it's a blended mode or how they transition themselves from a face-to-face -face teaching into an online uh, teaching uh, method. Uh, over there and obviously you know with how be how they are being student center uh you know taking student learning um as well as their learning outcomes as well for their you know for their journey and obviously the third one would be on their reflective practices in you know in terms of 
reflecting back on their teaching practice, you know, getting all of the data that they got from the teaching period and how did they look at that and say how they can, what have they learned from that and um, what are the ways they can improve from those teaching practices. So I think that's the three most important one. Great. So I think one of those key themes was continuous improvement and self-reflection. Have I am, I am I okay to summarize it like that? Yeah, that would be good. Uh, the next person, uh, uh, with, there is one in the chat, but we've got one through that came through for Tony. So we'll do that one and then uh, th the question for Anitra. So Tony, uh, you mentioned with self-determination theory that it's an intrinsic joy. How do you know that's occurring if your students aren't present? I think that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> Especially online when they don't show up and they don't engage. Um I think when I'm working with the facilitators at RMIT Online, this is the thing that we probably talk about the most, like how do you know if your students aren't there? And I think for me it's the progression piece. If they're progressing through their course and they're doing the assessments and their assessments are done relatively well, then is that not the best indicator that that they are um doing the learning whether or not they're enjoying it I'm not sure because I think about myself as a learner and I'm very self-directed and like to learn on my own and I love it but nobody would know that so I think and this sort of um, goes back to what Sarah was talking about when she spoke about engagement we look for as teachers we look for engagement in the traditional sense you know students talking in a discussion group or showing up and doing an activity but in online that those markers don't necessarily show engagement. Um, the backstage, we can't see. We almost have to trust. Mm. I think it's, sorry, one more thing. I think it's about creating spaces, though, where they feel comfortable enough to be able to come to you when they need it. Lena, is there anything you'd add to that? Sorry, could you go back to that, Dawn? Is there anything you'd add to how do you know the in, intrinsic joy is experienced if, you're, mm. if your students aren't present maybe in the online space, for example? Yeah, sure. If they're not in the online space? Yes, because you are. don't see them logging in or turning up to webinars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm extrapolating here on the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. So in a face-to-face -face <laughs> environment, I think it's always much easier because you know, they show up, you can see the body language, you can see when people are falling asleep in your class, all that kind of stuff. In an online environment, it is a little bit more technical and I know it's a little bit more data-driven because you can go into Canvas or into your LMS and run specific reports and see how long people are taking in specific areas or resources and time when they're logging on and logging off, when are people actually um, accessing their assessments, for example. Is it before the class? Is it during the class? Is it after the class? I think for me that that is the data that I would be looking for, especially after the class. That's the data or the information that I'd really be going to search for or look for actively. Um, and I, I know there's also other little things that you can do um, either before, or, uh, during or after the class with little tools like Mentimeter or H5P questions, whatever it is, um, to gauge, you know, whether that's a just a quick check your understanding or what how do you feel today you're happy sad did you feel like you had anything that got something out of um, today's session whatever that might be so there are various tools and technologies and data-driven approaches I think that you can take in whether that's a face-to-face -face or in an online environment great Anitra, I'm heading into the chat box for some questions for you. Have you had any success or been involved in projects to create affect in online teaching spaces? Um, yeah, a couple of things and bouncing off that hallway idea, which was the, the um, it's a practice that teachers do of uh, looking with, or design teachers do, you look with expert others. Um, and I used Pinterest to create um, sort of a space for that. So what we did was have, um, design teachers uh, 
all the students had to collect things in a Pinterest board. They had to put those into a discussion topic. And then teachers had to then like the things that they thought were good. So that was sort of like a, um, we're, all, we're all looking at this together, but that's good. That one's okay. That one's not so good. And to try to get that effective charge when they got a like from their teacher. Um, and we put that in all of our courses. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say it was a fairly successful exercise, although I'm not sure that the students really understood why we were doing it. We tried to explain it, but, you know, it's it's one of those things where they're kind of like, well, I have to do these pins, why? But we wanted them to also get into the practice and a lot of them loved doing Pinterest after that. But um, so that's sort of so that was semi-successful. And then we had um, another idea where we tried to create in our student portal, we had a hallway. So they had to go through um, student and they had a display of student work like a rotating carousel so every time that they would log in teachers would nominate what they thought was a grade work and that would just come up on the screen and it was a, a school of 23 different schools of art and design so you would get all sorts of things that you would see you would see interior design you'd be industrial design architecture um, and that was a everyone really liked that it personalized the space and made it feel more like they were walking into campus. Um, so there are just a couple of things that I was able to do while I was um, while I was uh, co-chair there. Um, does that answer the question? If not, please let me know. Um, yeah, and I, I, that guidepost narrative question that Wes asked there, if you don't, if you don't mind me picking that one up, I think that's what makes affect so tricky and difficult because it isn't something that's necessarily done through words, although words are part of it, right? Like it, it is, it is a feeling that you have to create, um, and then that that that's what makes it so difficult to work with and so difficult to translate into online spaces. Um, so I'm not sure that I've been able to successfully use it sort of narratively or explain it to students because they sort of have to feel it. And that that got back to what the chair was telling me, which is the problem that I had problem. So it's such an interesting un problem to think about. Like, should you be making people feel fear or not? I don't know. I'm still conflicted. Don't know. Does that answer the question? I hope so. So how does accessibility come into designing beautiful learning spaces? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Standard content of a space for accessibility purposes is unavo unavoidably renders certain sameness across those spaces, which seems to kill the kind of joy that we marveled at just moments ago in your photos. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think that beautiful, interesting spaces are necessarily less accessible ones, I guess is my answer to that. And I'm a big fan of standardizing things. So I don't think that that's bad necessarily. I'm, I'm just sort of putting a provocation out there of more than merely decorating, how can we truly make those spaces a beautiful place to walk through? If you think of uh, any kind of big budget, big money-making online space, there's a lot of work that gets done into making those very effective places, maybe not necessarily beautiful places. If you think of Facebook, um, a lot of money's been spent to make people stay um, and to feel an effective charge and to keep coming back online spaces, online learning spaces don't do that. So um, I think that they can still be accessible and I think those principles still apply no matter what. Um, and I think that beauty is a part of bring, that brings joy, but not the only thing. Um, and that we need to think about sort of the effective properties that we can create, that we can make a place sticky and um, interesting to come back to and a place that students want to come into instead of a place they have to come into. I hope that answered the question. Which possibly in online learning could also be because we're always encouraging online students to create a study space at home or somewhere. So I think maybe that could come into that as well. So what does your study space at home look like? So you know that it's a cue to start studying. What do you have in there that helps make you feel calm or motivated? Or even little online dens, you know, the way that MySpace used to let people create their own, curate their own online environment and feel a sense of ownership kind of really interesting things that we could do. Next one is a question for Chin. Chin, in recruiting online teachers and looking for those qualities that you mention and see as vital, what techniques do you use? Actual interviews, video presentations, written CVs, professional referees? Maybe if you want to comment which ones are the most useful or effective for identifying joy? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Alan, for that question. Um, I think we use a lot of those techniques and we're trying to gather data 
uh, from all of those resources or ways that we can actually find those, you know, those uh, joy factors that we can see in there. So, so it really depends on the client that we are working with. So if we are looking for a teachers in a short courses, for example, that tailor for a group of, um, you know, workers working for the industry and they want to study something you know during their work hours for example so we're looking for a certain kind of facilitator that meet those kind of requirement where they have a you know they have a uh, they have a cutting edge um, industry knowledge they are available uh, they are enjoying interacting with other colleagues from the other companies for example uh, looking for data uh, that telling about their uh, previous teaching score they might be sending in their video teaching presentations or we run a, te uh, you know, a teaching test, you know, for them and give them a topic, you know, they teach me something in 10 minutes and see how they engage with the whole process, right? And with another client that might work for another client where, where there is really no webinars or no live session, you know, running as such. So it's only moderated in discussion board, projects, marking at the end. So, so we're looking for data that people can providing a lot of feedback, you know, a lot of people love, you know, written feedback, providing those activities for the students. So, so we have to match, you know, that, that sort of process. And the more data that I work with, the better. So to see whether the particular candidate could be suitable for, you know, an, um, a weekend or a nightly delivery um, or just asynchronous delivery or synchronous delivery or a corporate kind of delivery or what kind of topic that I'm working on. Um, but most people these days, I mean, most clients these days, you know, they want someone who is very um, uh, cutting edge in their in their knowledge and ability to to engage with and sharing knowledge with other people. So all of these, I would say, all of these methods would be, would be useful for me. Great. I love I love the idea of teach me something in 10 minutes. Yep. Uh, next question. Do you think this is for the whole panel? We'll get each of you to respond. Uh, Lena, we're going to start with you. <laughs> Everyone ready? OK, we'll call it rapid fire. So you'll each have what, like 10 seconds to respond. So do you think in relation, and it's in the chat box as well. So do you think in relation to joy, able to joy being able to be caught that without an authentic sense or joy or real interest and excitement for the content from the teacher, a learning space of joy can be created? Okay, so you're each gonna, did I say 10 seconds to answer? Yeah. So you've really got to think about your answer. Okay. Letting you buy some time as I set my timer. Sure. Did we say uh, we can start with Lena? Lena, over to you. All right, thank you. I think that it is our duty of care as educators to our students to find the joy. That is our job. It is to find the joy, even if we don't necessarily have a natural strength or lean in to a particular joyful um subject content program whatever it might be and if over a period of time you're finding that there is no joy then I would probably ask the educator then are you in the right spot nice love that uh Tony uh, yeah I, I think a teacher um can make a break joy if if the teacher has no joy for a subject I think it doesn't matter how much the learner comes in feeling excited about the learning, they're going to have it zapped out of them because it, it's, I think it is 100% contagious. Yeah. Ken? Of course. I love this question. I think this question is amazing. It's an amazing one. Um, the reason I find this uh, is interesting is that we have been working with a lot of online students for the last probably six, seven years already. And with the, um, you know, unbundling of the higher education system where, you know, where the quality of the course sit with the learning design team as well. It is sitting with the customer success team, which is student support team. It's also sitting with the teaching delivery team, which is the facilitators team. So it's all have to work in sync with one another. So where, where can find, where, where joy can jump from one place to the other place. Or, or all jump at the same time. So from what I'm seeing with RMIT Online, for example, we got, um, you know, for the new course, you know, when it started, we got a very low OSI, for example. 
but we have very high, very high, uh, you know, GTS, which is a facilitator score, teaching score, for example. So you know where joy has been created in there. So obviously, there's a lot of, there's a lot of take in terms of the facilitator to make the course more interesting. Or, you know, and then to increasing the OSI, which is the overall student satisfaction index on the on the course content itself. So over time, this joy will be jumping and it's all increasing in there. And the OSI also increasing and the and GTS also increasing, for example. So yeah, so that's for me. So uh, joy that, can be- I think what, what Chin's talking about just for those acronyms, there's student satisfaction, student satisfaction metrics, just so everyone understands. Yeah. So so joy can be found in different places. And 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 I would say I would say it will have to take all of those, you know, all of those three main bucket, you know, to make joy happening. Great. Over to Anitra. Um, I think it's a particularly interesting question if you're teaching asynchronously or primarily asynchronously. Um, how can students catch enthusiasm from you if you're not face to face with your students? Um, so my challenge in my last job was that we were doing design studios entirely asynchronously as a worldwide um, organisation. So no students could be compelled to be in any one place at any one time. Very difficult to translate the joy and have students catch your enthusiasm. So I'd say that you have to look for other ways and that your advantage of being an asynchronous teacher is that you can record something when you're feeling a little bit more happy and joyful to, to Lena's point, when you've got a bit more energy and you can connect the students to the content by making little TikTok-y style videos, by doing those sorts of human things and injecting that human back in, it doesn't necessarily have to be face-to-face -to, -face to be caught. Um, and also in the way that you write, the way that you respond, things like emojis. I think that you can translate and communicate that, that joy, even if you're not feeling it, that's your advantage in being asynchronous. So I'm just going to put that provocation out there. Thanks. It was a great question. Great. We'll do another round robin um, with uh, resources that you'd recommend. Favorite resources for transitioning into online teaching for intermediate or secondary science class, but we can keep it to just any resources that you'd recommend. I, I've suggested checking out um, a Sarah Prestridge's collection. Um, I was going to suggest looking up things like digital pedagogies. Um, because I think the issue that most face-to-face -face teachers have when they move to online is they're trying to replicate what works so well for them in the face-to-face -face environment in online. And going back to that other question of when somebody said, what, how do we know our students are in online or experience intrinsic joy? And we don't. And when we are so used to getting feedback from our face-to-face -face students immediately, it's very difficult in the online space. We don't receive that. It then starts to, we get that deflation feeling like I don't enjoy this. This is not what I'm used to because I really enjoy the feedback that I get from my students and now I'm not getting it. So I think it's not necessarily looking for resources to help you. It's more about looking at ways that you can enjoy teaching online without getting that immediate feedback that you would normally get in a face-to-face -face environment. Well, and for me, thank you. Um, Thank you, Tony, for that point. I think for me, it's, it's really, about, really about the um, continuous improvement, right? So every single time you got a different cohort of students, you got a different group of students, you can only be as good for that particular group. And the next, it doesn't guarantee anything when you had another group of students, for example. So it's a continuous learning journey that you will need to refine your, your teaching practices every single time. Uh, and you will need to pause, you need to check in, you need to, to read your class, you know, and then you get all of these tools and, and, and strategies out. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Anitra? Really made me think hard. I thought, where do I go <laughs> for advice on online teaching? And I realized I don't really go anywhere. So I want to sort of say what Tony said and also what Chin said. Um, I think it's in the way that you, the what your mindset is and, and trying not to replicate. It's like moving to a new city, right? You're not going to find the same restaurants. You have to find another restaurant. Um, but also there's ways to encourage your students to give you the kind of feedback that you need because you do need that 
backwards and forwards to understand whether you're, you know, there's life in their eyes, right? You can't see their eyes anymore. You can't see whether there's life in their eyes. You have to find other ways to get that to you. So um, asking questions, finding ways to um, get students to respond to you, post little things for you, have chats with you, have informal chats with you. You'll be surprised at how much communication online actually happens in those kinds of ways um, that you have to actually actively foster for yourself. Um, it is a hard transition, especially if you've been in a really quite a physical learning environment like that. That's a, that's a tough call. Um, if I can think of anything, I'd love to send it on to you afterwards. Um, probably some papers to read and things like that would probably be the best thing that might help you. But to understand that you're in the struggle, the rest of us are. I often talk about online teaching as handling toxic waste through windows with gloves on. And that's a bit of, a, bit of a negative metaphor, but you are removed from your students. And that is a challenge. And it's a challenge that all online educators, especially asynchronous ones, are, are with you on that. Um, so don't feel alone, I guess is kind of what I would leave you with. And can I just quickly say one more thing um, to back up with Anitra is saying, I think go um, and do online courses yourself like this. This is an online space right now. We're all remote and we are learning together in a collaborative way. And most people have got their cameras off and yet we're still learning. And I feel like we've got a community. So reflect on this moment. What was joyful for you in this moment as a student right now? And how can you translate that in your own practice as a teacher? And then go try other online courses. Do a LinkedIn learning. Go find a short course. Join a free webinar with one of the companies that are doing them. And then reflect on those experiences and think, well, what worked in that situation? What got me engaged? And that's what you can then bring to your teaching. And Tony, like um, Lena said, uh, what did she say at the very start of hers? Find out what's not bringing joy and and transform it, but try and identify it. So that's a kind of compliments what Tony said as well. Do you think in relation to joy, oh no, we did that one, sorry, my bad, as I start screaming out another question. Um, so that looks like any other questions from the audience? Would anyone like to take the mic and speak or would anybody like to pop another question into the chat box? Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Wes. Just noting uh, Lena had to duck out early, so... And I think that we definitely got all the questions. If I missed your question, just rewrite it now and we'll get to it now. Um, great, so I might pass it back then to Christina. Thank you very much, Don, for that. And thank you very much to all the panelists for making this a joyful afternoon, early afternoon or late morning depending on your time zone, or maybe even late evening or very, very early morning. It was wonderful to see the many different ways of how we can bring joy to the classroom. The, the online space, um, whether that is synchronous, asynchronous, or also for, just fully online when there's not that much engagement with learners um, available. So I hope everybody has learned some techniques and has gotten some ideas of what to try and reflect on going forward um, when we are entering this merry season. May it also be joyful in the teaching sense. And so that concludes um, this week of webinars as part of the code week, uh, the Asia Pacific Online and Distance Learning Week um, that we are doing in collaboration with Eden in the Northern Hemisphere and their partners. And um, these webinars were co-organized um, between FLANS, Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand, and ODLA, our equivalent, on the other side of the Tasman. And so if you are not yet already a member, you can decide in which organization you want to become a member. It is kind of recommended that those of us in Aotearoa, New Zealand, join FLANS, and those of us in Australia join ODLA because then you get membership in the other organization already anyway. And so you can benefit from two organizations for the price of one. 
So we look forward to seeing you at one of our next events uh, that will be announced for Flans in the newsletter and also in our events calendar and for Otla on the Otla website. And now that we are at the end of today's session, I'm going to finish with a karakia so that we kind of get back to the rest of the activities of today. Kia fakaira te tapu, kia vatea ai te ara, kia turuki fakataha ai, kia turuki fakataha ai, homie uie tai kie. So now all the restrictions are moved aside so that the pathways are clear to return to our everyday activities. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day.